Thank you, and uh, hello, everyone. Lovely to see uh, quite a few familiar faces in here. Um, I'm aware that I'm speaking uh, in front of a, a very experienced and skilled audience, and I have to say, when Joe asked if I would like to talk at this event, um, I wasn't quite sure which was the strongest emotion, absolute terror or um, immense um, honour of being, being asked. Um, kind of 50-50 at the moment, I think. <laughs> but uh, I, shall, um, I shall do my best, and I thought I would um, sort of try and bolster my confidence a bit by thinking about how far I've come since my early days with a camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, this is actually one of the better ones as well. <laughs> um, yeah, the caption is interesting. I mean, talk about trying to state the bleeding obvious and then, and then absolutely <laughs> failing to do so. I have no idea why I've put that it's... Um, standing up when it's quite clearly sitting down. And I've also no idea why I've put all three photos in, but I'm sure at the time it seemed like a good idea. In terms of the title, Mood versus Composition, I'm not talking in terms of mood as in a moody picture like this, really more about, um, you know, if you look up the word mood, it's a, a temporary uh, state of mind or feeling. And um, really thinking about how our compositional choices are determined either by the mood we're in or indeed by the mood we wish to convey and how that sometimes can kind of it, it can it can help us in our compositional uh, choices but it can also be a bit of a challenge an example here of what i feel is um a it's, it's a, a good composition i feel it's well balanced it's a, it was a beautiful scene a few weeks ago standing on the beach in harris a uh, couple of days before a workshop there and it was just a wonderful morning. And while I actually took this, this exposure, which was four minutes long, I was watching gannets dive bombing out at sea. So it was wonderful. But as a, as a picture, for me, it's probably it's peaceful, but I don't think it's something I'd keep coming back to. It doesn't really invite me in to explore. Conversely, this one, actually made on the same beach a little bit later, I feel has far more energy, far more depth, partly maybe because of the reflected light. But actually, it's a... It's a perhaps a less obvious composition. It's all really with the echoes of the, the waves and the distant hills um, that really kind of make that one, as well as that, just that energy from the waves, I think. But for me, anyhow, this is one I would, I would feel much more like exploring. The other, the other image I felt was it just felt a little bit flat. This is a quote from a Canadian portrait artist, but I rather liked... Um, rather like this one, because it, it is true, it's, we always have that challenge of where, where do we put our rectangle, where do we put our edges, uh, and it, it's always, always difficult to decide. Sometimes it may come obviously, but so often there's, there's some kind of compromise you have to make. Um, this is an image uh, looking at what the art, some of the artists did by um, somebody called Hugo Barr, who didn't live for very long, uh, died in 1912 at about uh, 40 years old or so. Um, but I, I think I came across this image on Twitter, and it just struck me that it was an absolutely beautiful landscape. And yet, you know, if you analyse it, and bearing in mind as a painter, presumably he, he didn't have to compose it as he did. You know, he's put the tree smack bang in front of the houses, he's cut the top of the trees off, all the sort of things that you can imagine in a competition getting a big no-no. So it's interesting to see, you know, what the choices he's made. And it's, it's, to me, it's a beautiful and very well-composed landscape um, Painting. This is one by Lauren S. Harris, who's one of the Canadian Group of Seven, and uh, an artist whose work I love. I saw an exhibition down in Dulwich um, some years ago now, probably about 10 years ago, and bought some cards, one of which was this one. And it just struck me again that, you know, he's cut the edges of the leaves off, he's got a bit of a sort of a tiny little edge of the foreground, all these sort of things that we're told we shouldn't do. But again, it's just, a, for me, it's a stunning painting. I love the composition, and you can see, actually, it's very well thought out, very well balanced. Um, but again, you know, you imagine if you, if you took that as an exact photo and, and put it into a competition, you know, what, what would be said, I can, I can probably guess. <coughs> Similarly here, uh, I've obviously... Cut, cut the top of the trees off. Uh, or, or whenever you're uh, photographing woodland, it's, it's always that, that question of, kind of again, where, where do you stop? And in, 
in the woodland in um, the north, it tends to be incredibly chaotic. And in my early days, I used to shy away from that a bit because I just thought, I do not know how to tackle this. Uh, but I've come to embrace that chaos, and I've sort of learned to accept that you've got to cut things off, you've got to have white sky in your image sometimes, you've got to accept that you may have messy bits at the edges, um, but you just have to find a way to make those uh, images work and speak to you. And these uh, birches in Guyscliff Wood and Nidderdale, I always admire them every time I walk past, and this is the only time I've managed to get a, an image there. Um, the conditions obviously helped with it being quite a foggy morning, uh, but I spent a long time setting this up, and I spent even longer uh, processing it because it was very hard to recreate that lovely atmosphere in the actual um, handling of the image I found. One of my decisions was about where to crop it. I, I had it in my head as a 5x4 when I took it, but my camera doesn't show me the edges, and actually it has ended up as a 5x4. But I did wonder about that bit of bright sky at the top and whether that was going to bug me a bit. But actually, if you were to to say make it more of a six by seven and go down below there, you lose that very elegant um, curve in the, the birch tree on the right hand side as you look at it and it becomes a totally different picture. So all of those, those decisions are, are, are things that we have to live with and I guess be comfortable with and go with the one that gives the, the, the best mood, the mood that we're after for that picture. Conversely here, this was not in, in some respects a, a carefully composed image because it was taken during Storm, Bo St <laughs> Storm Barbara up at um, Oldshaw Moor in Sutherland uh, a few years ago when there were those big storms at Christmas time. And uh, it was incredibly hard to stay still for starters. And obviously when you've got crashing waves, you never quite know how they're going to roll. And I remember when I looked at this image on the computer, at first I felt I wished I'd left a bit more breathing room. But actually I think that very tight, constrained uh, crop, even if it was forced on me, actually adds to the sense of a threatening mood and really brings out the, the mood of a, a threatening storm. So I think in this instance, those constraints uh, worked in my favour. And I do find myself now quite often enjoying some quite, quite extreme um, crops. Uh, another image here that, when I took it, I think I did have in mind this crop again because I can't do it in camera. I can't always remember when I get back exactly what I wanted. But I mean, there was nothing here to stop me going wider. But if you start to go wider, you lose that, uh, th those strong shapes here. And it's one of those images, when I look at it, I can't entirely decide why I feel it works. But it, it's an image I find myself coming back to and one that I feel has sort of stood the test of time for me. And that, I guess, is really all we can ask for. Similarly, this one, I think, has, with having quite a, certainly a tight crop edge to edge, has really honed in on those lovely little echoing shapes with the, um, the line and the sort of slushy ice and the mountains behind. This is a little area just near Jokulsalen in Iceland that I love. Uh, it has these wonderful slushy puddles, as I call them, and um, it's absolute heaven to photograph. But what I have done here is I've given quite a bit of breathing room at the top and the bottom which I think adds to that sense of calm. Never came across this um, quote before until I was searching for, for quotes on composition the other day, and I thought it was a, a super composition. Obviously, uh, we don't have quite as much freedom as Picasso um, because we, you know, we're constrained by what's in front of us, if you like. Um, and the word like is perhaps not what we choose, but it's, it's certainly true that we have to make decisions about what elements we have in our frame, and we have to find ways to make all the different components work together. A rather humorous example here uh, in Namibia last year, um, and I, we stopped the car to photograph this giraffe, and this tree was uh, somehow mimicking it uh, behind. It was a lovely little moment, just complete luck. Um, but I love the sort of startled look on the, the giraffe's face, almost as if it sort of feels somebody's making a joke behind it. Um, but it was just extraordinary the way there was that funny little echo there and the two just sat together so nicely. But nowhere, I guess, is it more, <coughs> more difficult, I find, to, to try and get all those elements to work uh, harmoniously than somewhere like one of my more local patches of the Yorkshire Dales because you've got that combination of man-made and natural elements. And in some instances, the man-made elements are obviously beautiful. I mean, I love all the little barns and dry stone walls, but other times there are things that may be great and you don't want to include. 
them. But even when you do, there's always little edges everywhere nicking, nicking into the picture. So I've kind of learned that you have to, have to live with those and you have to just, again, find, find the version that you're most comfortable with. This was a few years ago on a wonderfully uh, foggy and frosty winter's morning at Brimham Rocks. And this was a location that I always used to struggle with. I think I was too hung up on the fact that it's called Brimham Rocks and all my efforts were concentrated on the rocks, whereas I came to realise that what's so special is actually the way you've got that um, combination of all these different uh, parts of nature kind of living happily together. You've got the rocks, you've got the trees, you've got the heather, you've got the grasses, and it's, it's the way they all sit together in the environment that makes the place so special. And finally, when I think I came to realise that, I suddenly found I was making photographs there that I actually liked. Uh, and this is probably still one of my favourites. It's not one I'd want on my wall. I feel it's quite a, it's a very emotive picture, but it's um, not perhaps sort of easy on the eye. It's quite, almost has a slight threatening feel to it, but it definitely, definitely sums up the things that I enjoy at Bremen Rocks. Another uh, quote that I rather enjoyed from the Canadian portrait artist, uh, I, I liked the idea for starters that the messy background somehow made it easy because <laughs> normally I think in landscape photog photography it's, it's one of our challenges. But I also really liked her second comment here about um, not taking over the, the composition of the subject and it reminded me of a lovely quote of Joe's, uh, well jo jo that Joe gave of Ansel Adams in his interview uh, for the Togcast earlier this year. Um, and I don't remember the whole quote, but basically he was talking about photography being uh, an instrument of love and revelation rather than sort of, if you like, imposing your will on the landscape. And that's something I'm very conscious of is that, you know, the landscape is bigger than, than all of us. So whilst, you know, I want to uh, put my point of view across, uh, show the way I see things, I sort of feel that the landscape's got to be allowed to to sing out loudest because that's that's the important thing. That's why you know why I'm out there. Thinking about how we do handle those those messy bits. Um, this is a a fairly chaotic picture in some ways, but but for me it's got a very very strong structure through the all the shapes in the birch tree, particularly actually with its broken broken bark branch. Uh, but also I just loved the way the the birch leaves were sparkling and almost flowing into the image. Uh, and it's another one that, when I took it, I think I was expecting to do a five by four crop. Uh, but when I got back, I felt, no, that was too tight and I've actually brought it out a little bit. I think, for example, if you lost the, the um, straight birch trunk that you can just see towards the edge on the left of that frame, if you, if you take that out, it become, it, it's, I think it still works, but it becomes a different picture. It, it loses a bit of its airiness and a bit of its sense of peacefulness for me. An even messier bit of woodland. This is just up the road from where I li live. And whenever there's a bit of fog or mist, if I've got time, I'll just pop into there for an hour or so. And uh, it makes life a hell of a lot easier if you've got the strong fog like this, which is quite rare because it's on a hill. <laughs> and I really loved the, the way those beech leaves were just going in that in those conditions and it's it's usually that 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 subject if you like when I'm in the wood that really draws me in the beech trees there are, are in the sort of slightly less chaotic bit of woodland but like <coughs> the other one it's got that very strong framework um, within it and in some ways perhaps although it's a very very different type of image in some ways it has a similarly peaceful feel this is one from the same wood uh, later in the year uh, not quite as much fog, uh, beautiful spring colours, and I lo again, I love the, the beech leaves when they're that fresh, vibrant green. And I quite often will do what I've done here and actually shoot through the, the leaves a bit and just to try and give that kind of burst of energy and colourfulness that you get in springtime. I do find myself a little bit bugged by the trunk tree on the extreme right there, um, but you definitely can't take it out. The picture would become unbalanced. My thought is I probably need to knock it back a wee bit further. I haven't quite decided yet, so I've left it as is. Uh, but again, it, it was all about the mood of the picture for me here and trying to get the composition to sort of work with that. Sometimes I get images that, for whatever reason, I keep coming back to and I can't actually quite work out 
why I feel they work or why I like them. I know this is one that other people seem to have enjoyed, so I'm guessing that in, in some respect it, it does work, and yet when I analyse it, it feels a little right-hand heavy to me. Uh, but it has got some lovely swirls. It's got that lovely soft glow of a, of a sort of relatively old-fashioned lens, wide open. Uh, and again, it's sometimes I think you just accept that you like something and, and that's good enough. You don't perhaps always need to know why. A quote from uh, the great man himself this time. And um, I think the whole thing about instinct is, is, is such a, a true one. And I've certainly quite often found that I'll get someone and I think, yeah, I can see a lovely image there. And I'll, I'll take it and then I'll think, oh, I'm going to fine tune that bit. And I'll spend ages and ages faffing around, slightly changing everything. And when I go back home, it's the first one I like best. So I think sometimes. The, our immediate instinct is actually the correct one. Sometimes we don't have a ch chance to faff around. I mean, this was coming down from Benet Nature Reserve up in uh, Torridon a couple of weeks back, and it was stunning light, as you can see. And the view in front of me was everything I love about that area. I mean, Loch Marie and the pines and the mountains, beautiful clouds, I mean, perfect. So I thought, well, I'm going to just try and get a picture. Not, not really time or location to set up a tripod so I just took this one handheld and I know I was worrying a bit about where I was cutting things off but when I got back and looked at it on the computer I was actually pleasantly just um, pleased to find that it all seemed to hang together and I think the reason being because you've got the the kind of little notch of um, sky and in amongst the trees and then down here you've got a sort of counterbalancing notch in the lock and I think sometimes it's these little echoes which we're probably not aware of out in the field, but that when we, we're out there, somehow they're somewhere in our subconscious, and those are the things that, that will help us get these kind of compositions to work. This was very much an instinctive one, again, coming down a hill after a longer day walking, so I was quite, uh, quite tired, but just loved all the, the layers and textures and shapes and colours and everything here. And I had my 135mm lens on, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll see you know, what kind of image I can do with that. And I think I'm really glad I did, because I suspect I wouldn't have composed it as tightly had I not had that lens on. And actually, I think that really emphasises all those strong bands of colours and just makes you appreciate all the different layers and textures. I did afterwards put my uh, sort of normal <coughs> zoom lens on just to take a wider picture of the scene. And while it's, it's a nice, you know, pretty scene, I feel it doesn't have... Half the, half the same impact. It, you know, your eyes kind of wander all over the place a bit for that image, and it's, it's pleasant enough, but it just doesn't, for me, have the impact of the other one. Often, when travelling, of course, we're, we're, off, we're having to work quickly, we're having to work off instinct, because we don't necessarily know the place we're at. This was um, a last morning on top of the Drakensberg uh, last um, November, an absolutely stunning morning with an amazing inversion, up at about, oh, I think probably about sort of 10, 11,000 feet high, and uh, just looking down was just, you know, amazing. But as you can see, you're on the edge of a somewhat uh, steep and uh, long drop there, so you know, your, your compositional options are, are definitely limited. But I wanted to, to find something that um, kind of reflected all the beautiful different elements that was up there. And in some ways, it's probably not a a totally balanced uh, composition, and yet I feel it's just got that, that sense of just a serene, wonderful morning, um, despite the fact that I could probably pick some holes in it if I, if I tried. I won't. <laughs> <coughs> this was another one made in, in uh, high terrain in Ladakh um, some years ago, and I remember being persuaded by my husband to go for a walk, even though I was absolutely exhausted, because you're, you really are high up there, so every step is is absolutely knackering with a lack of oxygen. And it was just beautiful light uh, in the mountains. And I enjoy this kind of image, for, I guess, for the lack of scale. And also, maybe it sounds a bit odd, as often we're trying to get depth in our picture, but I actually quite like the way that parts of it almost look two-dimensional. The shadows at the back almost just looks like a shadow rather than a ridge. It's quite hard to work out what's going on. And I enjoy that, that slight sense of intrigue in pictures. Similarly here, um, probably reasonably obvious as a black beach in Iceland, perhaps not immediately obvious which black beach, but this was for me all about the, uh, 
the textures and the play of the light on the land and again echoes of shapes um, that I always enjoy playing with. This is an Italian painter who emigrated to Canada. There seem to be all sorts of uh, Canadian influences in the, the quotes and pictures I've come across for whatever reason. But I think, again, it, it was, I really empathised with what they were saying. Uh, and I think, the, for, for me, one of the most fun things about photography, other than being out in the landscape, is trying to find ways to reconcile what's in front of us to make a picture, you know, almost like a jigsaw puzzle, except there's no, no right way to put things together. So it's, it's your choice. Ah. Uh, so this I'm sure some of you will recognise as Hodge Close Quarry I'd never actually until last year been to that bit because I'd always walked in from other directions and I'd never gone to the other side of the car park so I hadn't seen this fun little hut but probably like many before me it drew my attention and I think the thing that struck me as so often does in these places is how nature almost claims back the land so I really loved the way there were just tons and tons of little birch saplings growing up and then obviously two much larger birch trees in front of the hut and it was trying to find a way to to show the the idea of nature coming back into the landscape so i wanted the birch trees to be really really prominent so part of what i did for that was to do a focus stack and make sure that the whole picture was pin sharp other than where there's a bit of um, movement from the wind obviously but pin sharp back to front because I want to give, give, wanted to give everything absolute prominence but also I very <coughs> deliberately put the uh, one of the birch trees in front of the door now I did that because it was otherwise too big of a black area for me and it was too dominant but interestingly when I showed this picture at a talk one time um, somebody said that they uh, felt that I had done it like that because they thought I was trying to show the idea of the birch tree not letting anyone back into the property which was a really nice idea I thought um, so it's always interesting to see how how those decisions we make will maybe make other people uh, interpret the uh, picture <coughs> this is another one I, I, I wrestled with a bit partly because um, David O'Brien who I'm sure many of you will know discovered this lovely little slab of rock around the corner from where we were photographing uh, earlier this year in Harris and I sort of felt it was his slab of rock but um, I have got his permission to show it so I'm all right <laughs> um, but I I've, it's a different you know it's not an identical composition so I haven't sort of gone and just copied him but the, the thing I I was wondering about when I was looking at it and I was actually looking at it with a client who was also working on you know the same scene albeit a different composition was about the the little knobbly slightly yellowish bit of rock there and whether or not to include that so she went much lower so that actually wasn't visible I think David actually went much higher so it was l less obvious but I actually really liked that bit of rock I have uh, desaturated a bit because I find sometimes the yellow lichens a bit too much but I liked the way it was I guess talking to the the bit on front on the front of the slab so again those sort of echoes and I also felt it tied in with Taranze in the background of it so it was one of those ones that wasn't one right way of doing it but for me even though it maybe draws the eye a little bit more strongly than maybe as ideal I just felt I liked that counterbalance and funny enough this scene I was working on with the same client as um, the last picture and we were talking about the wonderful patterns in the sand but we were standing to the right of this area where you had sand one side and grass is the other and if you were trying to shoot from there you very much had a picture of two halves so it was trying to to find a way where we could use the grasses to to frame the beautiful patterns in the sand but to make it much more harmonious which hopefully I succeeded in doing here so again it's it's just trying to I guess find ways to convey what it is that you find so so beautiful or so interesting as it may be with the scene in front of you probably one of the most challenging times I have when trying to do this is when I go cross-country skiing uh, quite often in Norway in Rondana National Park which has the most amazing scenery and the most wonderful birch trees, some of the best I've come across. And um, my husband is thankfully hugely patient, well, most of the time, and uh, doesn't mind me stopping. But it's tricky because for cross country skiing, you need to get up a bit of a rhythm. But I spend my whole time looking around, admiring the trees. So it's very hard to, to get into a good rhythm. And then once you have and you see something lovely, you've got to, if you stop, you've got to start all over again. So 
it's quite a challenge. And then when you want to get into position, you have to bear in mind that you've got skis, the best part of two metres on your legs, very long, thin skis which dangle off your, your feet. So generally speaking, it's quite hard getting into position. So you've really got to, got to want to do it. But I loved uh, these birches, quite, almost quite sinister with their strong shadows. But I think because you've got the, the, um, the leaves on that angled branch coming across with that lovely warm colour and light, that it just softens the image a bit and makes it uh, less sinister and hopefully a bit more appealing. But there's, there's definitely a touch of the sinister in there for me. Oh, there we go. Um, same, same location, but different day and different set of birch trees. Uh, this one really did involve a bit of um, sort of wandering around, trying to duck under branches and so on to get to it, and very, very deep snow, but definitely worth it. I just thought that wonderful bowing birch with its little army of straight trunks behind it was just so graceful and just so evocative. I mean, you can almost sort of see, see a sort of human in there. But I also love just showing the smaller details when I'm somewhere like that, just the, the little kinks in the snow and just the way the light plays off it. And the great thing is, even on a day like this, which was on the sunny side, just with the snow acting as a great reflector, you can, and I guess also with the dynamic range of our cameras today, uh, you can still find lovely images in these situations. This was a quote from a book I haven't actually yet read, but was highly recommended to me and I've just dipped into. But I, I love this quote because I think, you know, curiosity is definitely, it's, it's our friend. That's probably what, what makes us all keep going, is that what, wondering what's around the corner or it's looking at a map saying, oh, that looks interesting, what's there? And it's, it's something I love doing. And uh, I think it's, it, it's what helps us to to show what we love about the places we visit. And you always want to find something new, something different. Uh, no more so on uh, the Isle of Harris. Um, go back, I go there every year now, and uh, sometimes more than once. And the Golden Road is an area I particularly love, but the, the sort of little rocky inlets and the coastline I find is quite a challenge to photograph. So I'm always popping around a corner just to see if I can find a viewpoint that works. And um, I was aware of this area, but this is the only time I've ever managed to catch it in conditions that I felt were conducive. Uh, normally it's been far too sunny, which is just not what you want there. Um, but on this day it was lovely, sort of dreary day, but still a, a, a enough light to, to give things a wee bit of a lift. And it was great fun. This was actually a stitch pano, but just finding ways to, to get all the elements to sit together. In some ways, I preferred the, the closer version. To me, that's just got a feel of these sleeping giant whales, sort of ancient whales in the water. And I just loved the, just loved the fact that I'd found somewhere where I could get a picture that, that showed what I enjoyed about that landscape. Uh, back home in Yorkshire, one of the things that's been helping me to do that is I'm working on a guidebook um, for photo view. And it's led me to, I guess, to try even harder to find different places. So again, looking on maps, and then when I'm going somewhere, I'll sort of see a track up somewhere, and I think, oh, I wonder what's up there, and I find somewhere else lovely. So at this rate, the book's never going to actually get finished, but, <laughs> um, and if it does, you won't be able to lift it up. But, um, <laughs> but you know, places like this, it's, just, it's, it's actually a nature reserve, but one I hadn't really clocked, and it was when I drove past one day, and I just noticed these lovely hawthorns um, up above me and went to have a look. And this is another one of those pictures that I can't quite work out. Uh, I know I really like it, but I also know that I get slightly concerned by the hawthorn being so centrally placed. I don't have a position with putting things centrally per se, but in this instance, I wasn't quite sure if that was um, you know, the best thing to do. But it's actually one I, I had it at my exhibition here a couple of years ago, and somebody actually bought it. So it clearly works for more than just me, which is always, always nice. If, if somebody else likes it, it's a bonus. Another area that I discovered um, high up in Wolfdale were these wonderful birch trees and this was another one where I had some choices to make I guess in terms of how I composed it and I remember getting home wondering whether the sunburst was a bit gimmicky, a bit strong but actually if you, if you kind of put your hand over it and get rid of it you'll see that it, it just lo A, it loses its kind of depth and warmth and appeal and B, I think it helps counteract all those very wicked bright white patches of sky that we're not supposed to have in our images. So I think it, it all balances out and um, hopefully 
hopefully just makes the thing sit together and has the kind of energy and, and warmth that I, I had not felt in that evening. Another thing I often struggle with are overly straight trunks and this wonderful old wood in Nidderdale has a lot of beautiful oaks but quite a lot of them have straight trunks and that one is definitely straighter than I generally like but somehow because you've, I think you've got the, the contrast between the twisty one and the straight one and also with the fog softening everything as well I just quite like the, the sort of relationship between the two so uh, I guess as much as anything it's about trying to let go of some of your prejudices sometime and giving it a go. This is actually, believe it or not, a uh, photograph of Lady Hill in Wensleydale. You can just see it there. <laughs> and I was, when, I, when I went there, I was planning to go in quite tight and just use the trees as a framework. But those ash trees were so graceful and it was beautiful on that. It was a summer morning and lovely uh, bit of mist in the valley. And I just, I couldn't, for once, I couldn't cut them <laughs> off. Often I had no problem cutting off trees. So it's really become a, a portrait of two very graceful ash trees, and I'm always aware that our ash trees are a bit, sadly, rather threatened. So I, if there's ever a, a nice ash tree to include in a photograph, I, w I, will, I will do so. I think they're very undervalued trees. The flora and fauna is something I've become to appreciate a bit more about um, when I've been out working on this book. And I first time I've ever seen a beautiful little flower called uh, Primula farinosa, a bird's eye primrose. Now you're going to struggle, but it's that little, um, little uh, image, just uh, flower just there. And I was so excited when I saw this. And I wanted to show it in its wider environment. Obviously, uh, this is at south, southern scales. Obviously, there are compromises I've had to make. I mean, there was no way to get around the tree sitting slightly uncomfortably somewhere. But again, I think it still depicts the sort of sense of place um, hopefully um, successfully and it shows what a, I guess a special and unique environment it is and often the details at our feet are what are what do that I love nothing more than photographing uh, grasses uh, really just enjoy those so much and this was just a, a little patch of grass and a little ditch in Torridon on my way down from a, a hill one time but just couldn't you know I can't resist those sort of uh, landscapes it's part of, of showing you know what it is that's that's special in our world I think and as a last slide just to to go into that a bit more uh, this is actually a tiny little section of a, a peat bog that I've just visited with Yorkshire peat partnership earlier this year and um, they very kindly showed me one of the the places that they're restoring and the place is like a sort of battlefield from the Somme half of it but then you've got these amazing little pockets with really rich green sphagnum moss and as you can see a, a lovely sundew there so I wanted to try and kind of show a little bit of that world and it's very much work in progress but uh, the reason I was there was because I donated a bit of um, money from my workshops to them um, having um, been really struck by the work they were doing and above everything some of the statistics which as you can see there that you know that stunned me because I know we all talk about trees and I, I love trees as much as anyone but actually to see the influence of those little peat bogs I'd never had a clue that they were that important so uh, that was a real eye-opener for me and I think, you know, we're, it's all sort of, it's all very well us going out and photographing the landscape, but I think, you know, we, we all need to think of ways that we can show how special it is and, and maybe try and help preserve it as well. So that was a, a last thought for, for the day, well, not for the day, but for my part of the talk.